Hey, thanks for joining us today on the Jesus Famous Podcast. Today we're talking all about spiritual disciplines. And maybe one way to think about this is, what are the set of practices that we can implement into our lives that allow God's Spirit full access to our souls? So if you ever had questions about prayer, fasting, solitude, why do we do these things? Why are they a part of the Christian life? Then this is the episode that you want to listen to. And we're praying that as you dive deeper into spiritual disciplines, that you are blessed and richly rewarded through Christ. Well, Nate, happy Holy Week. Um, I know a big part of your prep for Easter is thinking about where you're going to hide the Nate egg. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious if you're, um, as you're prepping for your your sermons and messages, if you know where you're going to hide the treasured egg for your family. Yeah, still don't know. I'll have to figure it out, mm-hmm. what you're alluding to, just to clue everybody who's listening in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, each year, our family, we decorate a bunch of Easter eggs, and we... Uh, everybody does a one egg that is a self portrait. Oh, nice. And so we've got our whole family as <laughs> eggs and then we take the Nate egg mm-hmm. and I usually tell all the cousins and my kids who are obviously way too old <laughs> for Easter egg hunts. Now, uh, I tell them, all right, if you can find the Nate egg, you get 20 bucks. Oh, for heck that. yeah. So it's usually some like crazy hiding spot. We go out in this field, you know, so yeah. there's like a limited number of places to find it. But, you know, it's been like in a tailpipe of a van at the end of the road before it's, you know, it inevitably gets to the hot, cold, yeah, yeah. warm, you know, kind of gets into that mode. But yeah. Oh, I love it. That's so fun. Yeah, I mean, nobody's too old for egg hunt, in my opinion. Yeah, it's really true. I mean, it kind of depends on what you're getting. Like a grown man racing against other grown men for like (laughs) three or four jelly beans, that's probably a little too much. True. But, you know, if there's cold hard cash. I was about to say, 20 bucks, man. Anybody will run for that. (laughs) That's so great. I love it. Hey, um, Holy Week, uh, yesterday, we're recording this on a Monday. Yesterday was Palm Sunday. And we talked about um, this really cool passage on Sunday where Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Um, you've mentioned a lot about that. Uh, quick side note about that. You mentioned about the prophecies that were speaking of Jesus, how he fulfilled so many of those prophecies. Mm-hmm. But the way you laid it out was so succinct and clear. I always encourage anybody who's listening right now, if you have ever had questions about the prophecies of Jesus, Take a listen to that message. I think you spent about five or six minutes just running through what that looks like in Scripture. It's really helpful. Um, But we talked about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the donkey, what that meant for his ministry in the kingdom. We talked about Jesus going to the temple and dealing with the people who were um, out selling the poor and the injustices there. And we talked about this story where Jesus comes up against a fig tree, has a little bit of a run-in with a fig tree. (laughs) And I would like to dive into that story a little bit if you're okay. up for it, Nate. Um, I feel like you tell the story a little bit better about Jesus with this tree. Would you mind just filling us in about what sure, happened yeah. with Jesus and the tree? Yeah, so, you know, for anybody who wasn't there for the teaching itself or you're not listening, you know, at some point close to Easter week and Palm mm-hmm. Sunday, that's fine. There's a lot you can get out of this story. And what happened was Jesus came in at the triumphal entry. Everybody's celebrating him. They're singing messianic psalms about him. There's all this anticipation for him. And his first move after Mm -hmm. all that proclamation would have been highly anticipated. And for them, it would have been anticlimactic what he chose to do. He went Mm -hmm. straight to the temple, which would have been exciting because that's the epicenter of Israel's religious life. And so what's he going to do? there in the temple. Is he going to drive out the Romans? Is he going to call down fire? Is he going to make some massive proclamation? What's going to happen? Uh, But he really didn't do anything except Mark says he looked around at everything. And then he left. 
And the next day when he came back to the holy city from the town he was staying in called Bethany, kind of a commuter village away from Jerusalem, he sees this fig tree that is leafy, looks like it should have fruit, even though it wasn't the season yet for full-grown figs. And he approaches it looking for figs because he was hungry (laughs) and there weren't any and he curses the fig tree and then he goes into the temple after doing that and he drives out the money changers those that were buying and selling and he rebukes what's happening there saying it's written my house shall be called a house of prayer for all Mm -hmm. nations but you have made it into a den of thieves and then the next day as they're walking by again peter sees the fig tree they walk same path, same journey. And he realizes that it's been withered up from the roots. And Jesus says, have faith in God. Hmm. So um, the way that I tried to explain it to the church is that what Jesus did with the fig tree doesn't make sense to us unless it's connected to what Jesus did in the temple. Hmm. It's a living parable of what was happening there in Israel. Jesus walked up to Jerusalem. He walked up to the temple, just like he walked up to the fig tree. The temple looked like it had lots of fruit. It was spiritually, looked like it was alive, had all this activity and sacrifices and worship and all of that, just like Jesus walked up to the fig tree and it looked alive and like it had fruit. But upon further inspection, Mm -hmm. what Jesus saw in the temple was there was no real fruit. It wasn't truly a house of prayer for all nations. It was a den of thieves. It was a place of commerce. Their hearts were, in actuality, far from God. And just in the same way, when he looked at the fig tree, Mm -hmm. expecting and looking for fruit, it was actually fruitless. And so he cursed both and uh, said, let no one bear fruit to the fig tree. He said, let no one... Uh, you'd let bear, bear fruit from you ever again. So, uh, you know, the idea then of the fig tree was that, hey, this is a lesson, a yeah. visible lesson that Jesus is teaching and communicating. So what we tried to talk about in the teaching a little bit, you know, I wasn't trying to be a bummer on Palm Sunday, you know, we did <laughs> talk about, you know, Jesus coming, the king has come, you know, and all of that. But what is the king looking for? Yeah. Well, he's inspecting, you know, and he's looking for, a real alive, vital connection to God. He, he wants people to be about him and yeah. and honestly and truly about him, you know, not just uh, with this uh, kind of leafy, I kind of called it like a leafy Christianity, you yeah. know, which obviously we can totally have in our modern era. I mean, yeah. We're calling this Holy Week, you know, in a sense. And, you know, Easter week is like a perfect week to just play at spirituality. You know, like, oh, now all of a sudden, you know, like Lent comes around and people want to be serious about some small facet Mm -hmm. of their life before God. Or uh, the Holy Week comes, you know, and it's and I, you know, I love this week. I I think it's a beautiful week. I, I I. I, for my, for myself, I don't really, I'm not a Lent practicer, but for me, it's like Lent in miniature on Good Friday, you know, the Hmm. sorrow of thinking about the cross and my sin and what uh, was required to save me and rescue me. And then the celebration of Easter Sunday, like, it's just amazing. But obviously, you know, we could just go through the motions and, you know, once a year, get all dressed up and excited Mm -hmm. and, And that's it. Or we could go to church every single week and just kind of be going through the motions. I think that's hard to do. You have to really like harden your heart to be able to pull that off. Generally, it's easier Mm -hmm. to just withdraw from the fellowship. But anyways, we can easily do the external thing without any real from Monday through Saturday, deep personal connection to the living God. But that's what Jesus wants. He wants us to bear real fruit. So that's why to me, he cursed the roots of the fig tree and pointed out like, Hey, have faith in God. That's where the, 
root system of a human being is found in their connection to their trust in God. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that was a little bit of what we were talking about yesterday. I love it. Yeah, this story, you know, I've read this story a ton of times. I've been in the church for my whole life, and breaking it down that way yesterday was just so helpful for me. And you did link, you know, that living parable to our everyday lives when talking about spiritual disciplines, our connection to God. I like the way you said taking care of your roots, root care, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, just kind of diving into the story a little bit more. I wanted to ask um, if you could help us understand like our own like meter maybe of connection with God. Like how do I know if I'm connected with God, I don't want to be cursed by Jesus. I want my roots (laughs) to grow and everything. How would I know that I do have a strong connection or that I don't have a strong connection to God? Right. Um, What I need to do to have a strong connection to God. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, in a sense, the answer is in what Jesus was doing in that moment, right? What was he doing in that season? Partly what he's doing is rebuking the old thing because it Mm. was not creating a true connection to God. But what was he going to do within the week? He was going to go to the cross, suffer and die, be buried. And by that next Sunday, so one week out from that triumphal entry, he was going to rise from the grave. It's almost like Jesus's timing is the message. Like, hey, you can't get a true, real, vital, lasting, deep, significant, non-leafy, non-hypocritical connection to God in your own strength and in your own energy. So I've come. uh, I'm going to die. My death is because I'm fulfilling the law that you could not fulfill. Mm. I'm going to be buried. Uh, I died in your place. I'm buried in your place. And I'll rise from the grave so that you can have this vital connection to God. So in a sense, it's about the gospel itself, you know? And so I would never want anybody to look at the fig tree living parable or what Jesus did there in the temple precincts before the cross and say to themselves, man, my connection to God is in a tenuous position. Mm -hmm. It's fragile. There's a fragility to my connection to God. Uh, what, what I'm trying to highlight is, hey, once you, through the gospel, have a rock solid connection to God, no one, Jesus said, snatches the sheep from my father's Amen. hand. Amen. So once you're in, you are completely in. But what I'm addressing is the practice, you know, the personal yeah. like relationship uh, with the Lord. So Uh, I would never want anybody to feel like, wow, you know, here I am a Christian, but I feel like my connection with God is somehow on shaky ground. The reality of the Christian life is that you have the access and position to the father that Jesus had, you know, Mm -hmm. that was just deposited to you. It was just transferred to you. You have that same level of access. So in a sense, I've heard somebody say it this way before. It's like, you can have as much of God as you want to have. Mm -hmm. There's no metered connection. You know, there's no like upper tier of like, okay, too many terabytes. You can't (laughs) download at that rate anymore. You get all the access that the son himself has. You have that it's yours because of the blood of Jesus. And that's not changing. Yeah. Um, but to be thinking about, but how am I, how much am I taking advantage of that access? How deep am I letting my roots go? I think that's probably the, the better kind of question, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think probably each person has to just go to the Lord and ask some of those soul searching kind of questions, you know, of Lord, how, how much am I pressing into you right Mm -hmm. now? Yeah. And am I allowing myself to be distracted? Is there, Mm -hmm more that I could experience of you and from you if I were willing to make that a more significant part of my life? Mm. Um, or am I, you know, so is there, is there something blocking that yeah. in my life? And, you know, 
certainly there are blatant things that we can do that could make it obvious to other people like, hey, man, you're just you're sitting in front of your Netflix seven hours a day. You really think you're yeah. going to have a strong connection to God while, you know, imbibing so much screen content like that's not possible there might be big obvious things like that but i think a lot of times it's just like a subtle quiet thing that we need to take to the lord and say lord i i want more of you i want to taste and see that the lord is good so help me to press in further yeah into what i have in you wow i love that because what that highlights is just this humble attitude of coming to the lord and receiving it's not just about what you do to earn God's favor that's already been secured through Jesus. You can't change that, but we can receive more and more. There are things that we can remove from our lives that are like, it's like taking rocks out of like a water dam or something to let the spirit, the water of God into our lives more. It seems. Yeah, that's a good picture. Let's talk about some of the spiritual disciplines that we kind of touched on a little bit yesterday, because this is one of those things that, like you receive the love of God, you receive salvation, you are now identified through Jesus with the Father, and now it's like, okay, now what? Now how do I build this connection with God? How do my roots go down deeper and stronger? How do I become more healthy and connected to God? And this word discipline, I know is kind of a weird word for some people, practices, right. whatever you yeah. want to say, you know. What are the things that we're doing to make ourselves available to God's spirit. So um, there's a lot of them. I wanted to ask you about prayer. What is the significance of prayer as a discipline for us? And how can we start making advances towards becoming people of prayer in our lives? Yeah, so the that, that's probably one of the most significant spiritual mm-hmm. disciplines of all of the disciplines that are out there. It's hard to get away from reading even a few chapters of the Bible without coming across prayer as an activity that God is interested in and that God moves by. Um, So you're asking how can we engage more in prayer? Yeah. Yeah, I think I I recently, you know, for our uh, growth nights, mm-hmm. talk to the men about abiding in Christ in the word and in prayer. And I gave, you know, a lot of instruction about uh, prayer itself. But one of the things I talked to them about was that, uh, I don't know, there's something about prayer where you just, you can read about it, you can get like best practices for it, you can study it. But the best way to learn it is just to try to do it, I think. Hmm. Um, And by that, I think what I mean is alone and also with others. Hmm. You know, when you're praying with others, you get a chance to see how they're praying and it keeps you focused. Uh, So there's a lot of great ways to uh, pursue prayer. You know, for, for me... One of my real secrets in, in uh, prayer life, and it's always been, a, you know, it's always a battle. Prayer is going into the spiritual dimension. Yeah. It's dealing with the unseen. Um, but there have been a number of helps for me in my prayer life. One of them is I try to go on a prayer walk every day. And this is like a time for me to just speak with God about what's happening in my life, the burdens that I have, the decisions that are in front of me, the um, obstacles I'm facing, the pressures I'm going through, and to bring them to the Lord, including, of course, the people on my prayer list or that are in my life. And uh, that's been greatly helpful to me. And I've, always, I've heard from plenty of people over the years, especially men who have told me, Hey, that's actually been really helpful to Hmm. hear that you do that. Yeah. That's been a great paradigm, uh, for me. Um, so I'd encourage that. I think another help in perhaps helping somebody learn how to pray a little bit better is to, uh, pray through a Psalm, Hmm. uh, because the Psalms are the language of prayer. They kind of show a prayer life that God 
approves of and that he's ordained and Mm -hmm. is interested in. So you can always look at a psalm and in reading each individual line, kind of regurgitate those lines in prayer to God and kind of riff off of those sentiments um, to the Lord. That's a great way to pray. Of course, there's the Lord's Prayer um, or the Disciples' Prayer that the Lord taught us. And um, that prayer is beautiful because it shows us different categories that are good for us to be bringing to God. So the first one or the first prayer request that's often overlooked in that prayer is, uh, Father, hallowed be your name. So the first prayer request of a disciple is that what I want more than anything is for God's reputation or his name Hmm. to be uh, revered or hallowed. And so what that does to you is you're thinking about that in your own life, like what areas of my life have I not hallowed God's name or revered God's name? What things do I need to confess uh, to the Lord? It's just a great place to start in prayer. But then as you go through the prayer, there's so many beautiful categories to get into. I mean, of course, I love the sentiment or the prayer of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you're lifting up kingdom things. So uh, pastors and missionaries and gospel expansion and the success of the church in your local community and the planting of churches, you know, and things like that, the saving of souls. But then, you know, things like daily bread are also prayed for. So just Mm -hmm. my current needs, the things that individually I'm going through that I need God's Mm -hmm. help with. And then there's the category of temptation, lead us not into temptation. So you're dealing with like the whole realm of sin and needing God's protection and guidance and leadership over your life. And then there's forgive us our trespasses. So there's confession itself uh, that you're bringing to God and then your attitude towards others. So there's a lot of Hmm. surgery that's performed in, in that particular prayer. A lot of people like the, uh, acts acronym, you know, A C T S, which is a great way to pray. So a standing for adoring God. And I find anytime my prayer life is in a dry spot or I'm Mm -hmm. even just praying and I'm having a hard time really getting going. I find that it's through the worship, the adoration, the praising God for who he is that I'm really helped, you know, whether it's thanking him for his work in my life or thanking him for the gospel that's, you know, you've always got at the very least yeah. that to be praising the Lord for, or just kind of things about his nature, like the whole classic theology, you know, his omnipresence or omnipotence um, or omniscience, you know, or these different elements of who God is to be praising him for who he is to adore him. And then C uh, in the ACTS acronym confession. So confessing our sins to the Lord. And this is a great way to before God allow your heart to be searched to be Mm -hmm. thinking about different areas where you've fallen short maybe to kind of just be thinking about the last few days or the last week Mm -hmm. or the last month or an interaction that you just had with somebody and to allow the spirit to show you different things that you need to confess Mm -hmm. to him so confession believing that As we confess our sin, as John says, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then the T standing for thanksgiving. Hmm. So uh, thanking him specifically for what he's doing in your life. And I find this is a great exercise for people to go through to be kind of almost listing before God different elements uh, that they are thankful for that God is working in their lives or is done in their lives and you know thanking him for things that perhaps you've taken for granted as well is really important your health or yeah. his provision or key relationships he's brought into your life as well as the current things he's doing in your life and then s supplication where you're making requests for yourself and for others and a lot of times in prayer our tendency is to just jump straight into the supplication or the request. And I don't want to belittle that or create anyone this stigma or this feeling like I can't, I can't 
do the request thing until I go through the adoration, confession, and thanksgiving mm. thing. That's not the biblical concept or idea. God is a father to us. I'm a dad. There's plenty mm. of times my kids just ask me for stuff and there isn't a lot of adoration or confession <laughs> or thanksgiving before yeah. the request that they make. And, you know, our father wants us to come to him. So I'm not trying right. to create some, you know, system. I think that's the downfall of thinking about it in that mm -hmm. way. But there's all these different categories of prayer that can happen. And um, so I think maybe thinking about it that way can help a person tap into a life of prayer. I think practically speaking with prayer, it just takes um, time. Yeah, you know, it just takes totally. time and, and it takes some environmental discipline. So, you know, if somebody gets up, you know, really late and just says like, oh, I'll just pray in the shower, I'll pray in my drive on my way to work or whatever, um, you know, that can happen, but there's going to be a limited quality yeah. to that life of prayer. And we're talking about root care, really going down deep into our relationship with the Lord. Um, you know, some of the other things we'll talk about on the list uh, lend to a more highly, uh, a, a higher quality of prayer life. It just takes time, it takes quiet, it takes being alone. If yeah. you pray with somebody else, it takes like calendaring and space and totally. schedule to like get there. There's just certain things that have to happen to be able to pray um, effectively. So, you know, getting all those things set up and then just going to pray. Now, for Jesus, it just seems like his pattern and this, you know, really the for me, like the walking and praying thing, I think for me, I, I kind of saw that mostly from the Lord because mm. that's what he would do. You know, he yeah. would go out into the wilderness or to the mountaintop or to solitary places. Yeah. To and it was very clear he was praying. You know, he'd go to the mountaintop, pray. He'd go out into the wilderness early in the morning and pray. And uh that just what that feels like to me is uh a very relational kind of thing. Like he'd mm -hmm. been in eternal communion with the father as the second person of the triune God. And now here he is in, embodied in human flesh on earth. And he's just continuing the practice or the thing that he's already had in the past. It's different yeah. now because he really is dependent upon the father during his earthly ministry and in his humanity. But it's similar in the sense that the communion is there. It's unbroken. Yeah. And so going out into the wilderness for the friendship, the parenting, the encouragement, the, the whatever it was that he needed for that particular day. And I think that's a great perspective to have about hmm. prayer. Like, you know, God is my, he's my greatest resource. He's the best relationship that I have. He's got the best counsel, the best guidance. He's my father. He loves me. Um, I mean, to, to think of him even as a friend, Abraham was a friend of God, yes, to be walking with God. I mean, these are concepts that I think help kind of make the prayer life come alive a little bit. Like I'm, I'm going out to do this with, you know, God, mm -hmm. with the Lord. So obviously, you know, you don't need to go out into the wilderness to be able to pray. You can pray while you're driving or in the shower. You can do that. <laughs> You can pray seated at your dining room table. You can pray kneeling uh, on your bedside uh, or bowing on your living room floor. Mm -hmm. uh, you can pray in lots of different ways. Uh, but to think of it like that, I think, has been really helpful to me, at least, yeah. to keep me going in prayer. That's so good. There's like so much. I feel like I want to ask you about all of that. But I would just emphasize that idea you just communicated about planning it mm. and um like scheduling it but also saying you have to say no to a lot of things to 
make time for these disciplines. Prayer is not one of those things that's just going to kind of stumble across your Instagram feed or your YouTube algorithm or your daily commute. It's just like, man, we have to really make time for these things. They're so important. Um, and they do look different, but it just, it always will require time. I've tried the walking thing before and I really love that. But recently I've been doing um, writing and I'll write out my prayers. For me, yes. like my brain sometimes when I'm praying in the morning is just spinning a lot. But to get down and to write down a linear thought to God has been crazy helpful for my brain. And writing just takes time too. I find that writing a page takes like 15 minutes sometimes or mm-hmm. I don't know how long it takes for everybody else. But you just got to make the time for it. It's such the, a huge the priority. The great thing about writing your prayers, and I do that also, is that yeah it feels like it's it takes a long time yeah you know because i mean especially with prayer it's like you can you know that you don't even really have to verbalize it totally. out loud you can mm-hmm. just be thinking it mm-hmm. to god he can you know commune with you in the yeah. spirit you know um so when you think about it that way it's like man, i could really pray for a <laughs> lot of things yeah pretty quickly yeah if i just you know prayed in that way but the distraction distraction factor. it's almost like you might think you're praying a lot less over 15 minutes by writing out your prayers that you're praying and you know meaning them from mm. the heart uh, but probably in the long run you get a lot more prayer done wow. because yeah. the distraction isn't there as much so you're staying like on track that's so true and discipline yeah that's a good one has there been anything for you nate like a because we have written down here a few different um, disciplines, Bible study, uh, worship and song, discipline of fellowship, fasting, good deeds, generosity. There's a, there's a lot of different disciplines, but has there been maybe one discipline that's been like a real game changer for you? I know we just talked about prayer for quite a while. I know that's been a huge part of your life, but is there one that you found that has really ignited faith or um, is it like, I guess what I'm trying to get at is do the disciplines have to all happen at the same time in your life? Do you need to create like a structure of all these disciplines at one time in order to see God's spirit rushing into your life? Or can you just pick up one and begin to develop that and pick up another one and pick up another one and kind of grow in them? Yeah. I'd always recommend that somebody do it that way. Um, and yeah, there's a cascading order for me. Like Mm -hmm. I've got, written down here eight disciplines and I'd love to share about them, but you know, the discipline of prayer, Bible study, worship and song, fellowship, fasting, good deeds, generosity, solitude and silence. I mean, I can easily look at that list and say, yeah, prayer is probably one of the regular like mainstay ones along with things like Bible study. Um, Whereas fasting is not as much a regular part right. of my rhythm. I know some people that mm-hmm. like to have like a weekly um, Christian fast. You know, I mean, I yeah. know some people do like the intermittent fasting and everything, but that's not what the Bible is talking about. It's like a health thing. Um, so, uh, but for me, because fasting is, um, I think it doesn't have as much of the biblical warrant as like prayer and yeah. Bible study do. I mean, it's, it's in there, totally. uh, but there's also like things about like hey, the bridegroom's here, you know? So it's a time for right. feasting also, uh-huh. you know, and, uh, and I like food, you know? <laughs> so, um, th- that's, that, that one is, uh, I think for, especially for me, as I look at fasting in the Bible for the most part, when you see it as a scheduled regular thing, mm-hmm. it was done by Pharisees. Right. Um, and for the most part in the Bible, the best fast, there was only one fast every year for the people of Israel. Mm. It's the day of atonement. But, um, and even that wasn't a 24 hour thing, but mm. uh, as far as I can remember, I might not be accurate about that, but, um, the best fast that they had were responsive fasts. Totally. An yeah. emergency, a mm-hmm. death, a uh, sin, and they respond by saying, we can't even eat right now. We're so yeah. broken up by what we, what has happened there. So 
I have that in my head, you know, so it's like, yeah, I, there have been times where I know I need to schedule a fast, I need to seek the Lord, mm-hmm. but that's much less of a regular thing than on the other end of the spectrum, really feeling a need to pray, you know, every day. Yeah. So that one's been really significant in my life. Mm-hmm. The uh, Bible study portion, you know, of a spiritual discipline, so like just meditating on the Bible, thinking about the Bible, that one's been uh, you know, really important to me because, um, and it's very different for me when I'm doing that from when I'm studying for a sermon or yeah. a teaching, they're just two totally different experiences. I do them in two totally different ways. The one personally is very prayerful, devotional. I'm not doing like careful, um, exposition or exegesis of the text. I'm just like allowing my inner person, my spirit to be reading the text, asking God, you know, what's here? What are you saying? How does this apply to my life now? What are you teaching me about yourself? What am I learning about the Lord? And just letting those lessons sink in for Mm -hmm. the stuff I'm dealing with today, you know, and the stuff I'm going through today. So I forget what you even asked me, but I was just asking about just, I mean, that you answered it. I was asking if there's like any one particular discipline that you found like really particularly helpful. And um, the way I'm hearing you talk about it is that there are multiple that are helpful and even seasonally they're helpful. Fasting may not be something you put into every day or even every week, but maybe as a response to what's going on in your life, God prompts you to fast. But maybe prayer is something you actually do every day in Bible study every day. Maybe you meet with your community and do fellowship once a week, a couple mm-hmm. times a week. If you're introverted, doing it twice a week is a real, it's a discipline, you know, it's a <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> Solitude, if you're an extrovert, that, that's a real discipline, you know. Um, yeah, that's what I was kind of curious there's about. There's seasons, yeah, you're right, there's seasons. Like, um, you know, when I'm going through significant um, leadership challenges, yeah. or like there's real hard leadership times, like in my pastoral life, there have been a handful of seasons that have just had bigger uh, pressures, you know, so yeah. when I was 30 and in my first full year of being the senior pastor of this church, it was just a lot, you know, and so for three or four years, there was a lot of, um, I, I just kind of made it a practice in my life to get out alone mm-hmm. beyond just my personal quiet time, yeah. but to just have time to think and kind of work through where is our church at? What is God's assessment of it? What are we doing? doing, getting out of just the like, uh, busyness and Mm. kind of being able to see with fresh eyes where we were at. And I think it was that experience that over the course of three or four years convinced me that, wow, we don't, we don't really know each other. We don't fellowship together. We don't have that as a, as a perspective in our church. And so i led towards restructuring our whole emphasis and having community be a major part of Mm -hmm. what our church is about. And I think that has remained to this day or a more recent example. And, you know, a lot of us were forced into a time of solitude, you know, back in 2020, Mm -hmm. but that for me, you know, because of all the decisions that pastors needed to make and all the anger that was out there and Mm, the different perspectives and philosophies of ministry that people were peddling at that time and still peddling, I had to really discipline myself to um, get out of the house, away from my family and have solitude to really think and pray about the decisions that Hmm. we were going to make together that I was going to propose to the pastors and Mm -hmm. all of that. So, um, but there's other seasons where that's not as uh, big of a deal, but where it's just kind of like, yeah, get, make sure you're still getting a healthy rhythm of some solitude uh, here and there. That's so good. And the cool thing about all that too, is that, I mean, you're talking about that from a leadership pastoral perspective, you're overseeing a team and everything. There's a unique set of pressures there, but even for the mom who may not be in a leadership role like that, but maybe working through a difficult time with her husband or with her kids, it's just as important for that person to get that solitude, to get that time away with God, 
to have those daily moments of connection with God in prayer. Um, it's not just like a pastor's thing. It's not just like the super Christian thing to be able to put these practices into your life. This is daily Christian living. This is connection with God. This is root care like we've been talking about. Um, I'm just thinking about some people I've talked to recently who feel like, I heard somebody say yesterday, I was talking to them and they were saying, I, I'm just not that guy who wakes up early and reads the Bible. I was like, of course you're not. If you're, if you're going to say that about yourself, you're definitely not going to be that person, you know? But you can be that person who does make connection with God every single day. I think we make a lot of excuses for these disciplines because they do seem so big. And they're, they're very countercultural in a lot of ways, honestly. Yeah. And so Nobody is that guy. Nobody's that. Nobody's we're not those that people. Guy. Nobody's born like no. that. Nobody's no, no, no. born doing that. Nobody's born with this as a practice of their lives. Right. This is why they're called disciplines. Nobody's <laughs> born weightlifting. Yeah. Nobody's born eating right. Nobody's mm-hmm. born exercising. Nobody's born with talents and abilities that they don't have to cultivate. Yes. None of those things happen. Nobody knows how to play an instrument that they just picked it up and did it. Nobody's like that. Yeah, you have to make a decision to say, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with our Amen. heart, mind, soul, and strength. I'm going to figure out how to do that. I'm going to make that part of my life. Hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't buy that either. You yeah. know, just the like. Now, I, I do buy the hyper rigidity that, hmm. that we should reject a hyper rigidity about um, how this looks. I mean, I've talked about this yes. before, like. You know, there's books out there that Christians have written where it's like, you got to figure out your pathway to God. Maybe you like building sandcastles or collecting seashells, and that's going to be the way you relate to God. And that is just so, like, have you read the Bible? Yeah. You know, it's being a person who loves the law of the Lord and being a person who prays. Like, you can't get away from these pathways Mm -hmm. (laughs) to God that are divinely, biblically sanctioned and ordained. So I just, I I think that what's happening there is that there's a confusion or a conflation with just the way God has designed us and things that we enjoy doing that are restorative and mistaking that as connection to God, like personal relationship with God. Like when I'm on a date with my wife and I'm Mm -hmm. eating a burrito, I really do enjoy that burrito, but it's not the burrito that is making me have fellowship with her. Right. It's talking to her, listening to her, hmm. asking her questions, sharing my heart with her. That's the the feeling of wow, I really like the taste of this chorizo with this guacamole hmm. with, you know. Come on. That's not the thing that is making the relationship happen. Uh, so um Does it have to be in the morning? No, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about that. But, you know, I've, I've counseled thousands of Christians in my lifetime. And I'll, I'm just here to tell you that, uh, for the most part, I, I, it's been very rare that I found a person who's been able to say, yeah, I'm able to consistently, uh, spend time with God later on in the day. It's just pretty rare that that happens. Generally it's a, I got to put that into my life first yep. and then the day unfolds after that. That's right. So, you know, people who say that kind of thing, you could be whoever you want to be. Totally. Like that's you. You could do that. You have that choice. God's not going to force you. He's not going to make you, you know, spend time in his presence. I'm just saying, I think it's a really great idea. You know, you got the creator of the universe right there at your fingertips Amen. with all the resources and power and ability and, and counsel and help and encouragement. It's like all there waiting for you. It's the greatest relationship that you could ever have. So if you, you know, if you don't want to tap into that, then that's, 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 that's on right. you. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it's, is a, is a very wise thing to make part of your life. It's worth it. Yeah. Nate, do you have any resources um, that you've come across, whether things that you've written or maybe a, a book that you've read, podcast you listen to, um, that would maybe help someone as they're thinking through the spiritual disciplines? Well, you know, there's, uh, there's a couple of articles I've written that 
on uh, at my website that you can just link in our show notes. I will for sure have, um, you know, a, kind of like a listicle of different spiritual disciplines. But the best, one of the best books on the spiritual disciplines, I mean, there's the Dallas Willard book on spiritual disciplines that everybody loves, um, but it's pretty heady. It's pretty heady. Not always accessible mm-hmm. to people. Um, so I always recommend to people um, the book by Donald Whitney, and the correct title escapes me so maybe you guys can put that in the show notes Mm -hmm. but Donald Whitney wrote a book it might just be called the spiritual disciplines but um he yeah he did a great job just explaining each one Mm -hmm. how to get into them um how to pray I mean his are his are really great it's awesome yeah if you're listening to this right now be sure to check the show notes we'll have different links to articles and books and all that good stuff. Um, Nate, is there anything else? I mean, we have, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. We'll limit it right now for people's digestion. But is there any like, word of encouragement or thing that's on your heart that you want to share with people right now just as they're thinking about taking a next step to invest their lives more into the spiritual disciplines and to yeah, connect my, with God? My encouragement is to just go for it. You know, you live in a world that's telling you to take baby steps mm-hmm. all the time. And, um, but I don't want to be a baby, <laughs> you know, like I, I just think it's like this slow incremental thing we're always talking yeah. about. Like sometimes that is the answer and I'd hate to overwhelm somebody and be like, Hey, what, devote the first two hours of every day right. to Jesus. Right. You know, if you've never done that before, But I also just sometimes hear counsel that's like, you know, just spend three minutes reading a verse and a minute just setting your mind on God today. And, uh, you know, I think you can do more than that. And I would just encourage you to go for it. Tell your friends and family, like, this is what I want to be about. I want to grow in this area of my life and be about it and go for it. Um, do not, and, and, and I think another thing I would say is I think a lot of times what happens in this area is that people, they'll, they'll see a Christian that they admire and kind of ask like, Hey, why are you this way? And maybe they'll say, well, you know, I've been spending time with Jesus for like this for a number of years. And they just quickly dismiss that. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that's not how that happened. That's not how that occurred, right? right. but that's how that occurred. Mm -hmm. So don't dismiss that so easily and say, no, it's not for me. It's not something that it can be done. Listen, you live in a world that is always putting the bar so stinking low is always just telling you to self accept and just, you know, be you and all of that. And I'll just encourage you like, Hey, these are things that are in the word Mm -hmm. that we can be, be about them, be about them and enjoy, you know, the access that you have uh, to God. So I don't know if that's an encouraging word, but just kind of a little bit of trying to coach somebody up like, Hey, you, you don't have to avoid this. You can pursue the Lord. Amen. It's so accessible today to do those things. But you have to make the decision to do it and have the yeah. conversations. And, and, and you're going to fail. You're not going to be good right. at it. You right. know, like I'm still trying to figure out how to pray. Well, I have Amen. plenty of days where I get done with my quote unquote prayer time. And I'm thinking, what did I really just do <laughs> during that time? Yeah. Every day you're falling on the mercy and grace of God. Yes. Uh, so thank him for that. But press in. Yes. Press in. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't feel like, oh man, I'm just inevitably going to slip into legalism. Uh, my joy is going to be gone or something like that. Get that idea out of your head and say, yeah, this can be something that's part of my life and figure out how it works for you. Amen. This is the shoulder or the hand on your shoulder telling you go for it. You can do it. Thank you, Nate, for your time today, talking with us about the disciplines. I'm sure we'll talk about this much more in the weeks and months um, and episodes to come. But thanks for your insight. Appreciate you. Can't wait to keep talking about these things.
We pray that today's discussion has blessed you. For more information and to take the discussion further, you can visit nateholdridge.com for additional articles and content. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe, and share so we can continue to reach people and make Jesus famous in our lives and the lives around us. Until next time, God bless.